uh, geothermal production testing and discharge testing of wells and flow rate measurement methods. The information was taken out of a grant textbook from Chapter 8, Geothermal Reservoir Engineering. So first, we're going to look at a quick video that shows a flow test. Um, this well is discharging and allowed to flow freely. Usually a flow colorimeter is utilized to track the flow rate of the well for production estimates, but this is just a free flowing discharge well. We see that the flow force is relatively quick. Um, it's definitely flowing quickly. So what is production testing? Production testing is the step in what is the step in well siting that follows the exploration phase. This phase includes taking production measurements to calculate and estimate the, expe the expected flow rate and energy generation potential of the well. This can last for days or weeks depending on the well size and how difficult it is to start flow in the well. The test evaluates the energy or enthalpy output of potential of the well and tests for the high temperature fluid and measures the fluid temperature and downhole pressure. Some basic equations used in production testing. Um, in most conditions, it is assumed that steam and water properties of a geothermal well are at saturation conditions and local pressure. However, some wells do produce dry steam and superheated conditions may exist. And in that case, steam properties must be evaluated at the temperature and pressure of the steam itself. These quantities are used to evaluate the well's flow characteristics. And we, all, we would look at the separated steam flow, the separated water flow, the total mass flow, which is the combination of the steam and water flow. Um, we also look at the fluid enthalpy the heat flow, the dryness factor, and the non-condensable gas and weight percentage. We use these variables in these equations, and this first equation is exclusively for saturated conditions, and saturated conditions, just a reminder, is when liquid and vapor mixture exists together at a given temperature and pressure. If any of the two of the flow characteristic variables are known for a well, then the others can be calculated using the first equation, where heat flow equals total mass flow times the fluid enthalpy. At separation pressure, the total mass flow is equal to the steam and water flow, and the steam flow is equal to the total mass flow times the dryness factor. So a quick example found in chapter eight is two phase fluid flow flows into a separator and the separated steam and water flows are respectively 48 kilograms per second and seven and a half kilograms per second. The pressure separation is 9.2 bar gravity. Uh, the pressure atmospheric is one bar and the we are solving for the mass flow rate and the fluid enthalpy. Uh, we will use the equation just discussed in the previous slides to solve for the mass flow rate and the fluid enthalpy. The bar gauge is the pressure of a system open to the surrounding atmosphere, and bar absolute is measured in a seal vacuum unit. Usually you just add one to the gauge to read absolute for an approximate value. The separated steam and water flows are measured at the same pressure, so they can be added together to get the total mass flow rate which is 55.5 kilograms per second. So moving on, the fluid enthalpy requires dryness to be calculated first, which is X, by dividing the steam mass flow by the total mass flow, we calculated in the slide previously. Then the dryness equation is rearranged to solve for enthalpy using the previously calculated value for dryness and the steam tables to find the values for enthalpy of saturated water and water. The heat flow is then Q is then calculated by multiplying the enthalpy that we solved for by the mass flow rate. The final heat flow is 57 megawatts.
here is a diagram of a separator pressure. Um, a two-phase fluid moves into the separator um, where a specific pressure exists and the phases are divided into steam and water and they have their own separate flow rates. So first step in flow testing is to initiate the well discharge. This is not usually difficult because most geothermal wells naturally develop sufficient pressure to begin discharge as soon as the well surface is drilled and then the well head is opened. However, some wells do not have enough pressure or have cold water at the top of the water column that prevents it from boiling and building up a sufficient pressure to flow. If a well does not spontaneously discharge after drilling, it will have a water level below the wellhead and the upper part of the water column will be cool, which is below the boiling point of the water. Discharge will require the boiling of fluid in the well bore, so to start the discharge of the fluid, uh, the fluid will have to be boiled or cool water will have to be replaced with hot water to initiate discharge. Sometimes a well may be dormant, apparently dead, with a water level that's not far below the wellhead, but containing a water column that is at boiling point. In this case, a small disturbance, if, such as just dropping an object into the well, may be sufficient to initiate the boiling of the water and begin discharge, kind of like starting a geyser. Uh, some alternative ways of starting discharge are pressurizing the well, using a gas lift, a steam or two-phase injection, or a workover. Once the well has been heated and discharged, in order to keep it live, you must maintain a very small amount of discharge, called a bleed, of either steam or two-phase fluid to maintain the well. When a well is shut, the well can pressurize themselves by building up gas pressure when the wellhead valves are shut. Some wells require pumping gas, such as nitrogen, down the well to raise the pressure and push the water level down so that the cool water at the top of the water column can mix with the hot water at the bottom and the surroundings below and heat up. The well valves are then rapidly opened, which allows the pressurized water to flash boil and discharge can start when the boiling fluid expands and lifts the water column to the wellhead and begins flowing, much like we saw in the beginning of the video. A gas lift is a well-utilized method for flowing liquid from water and oil producing wells. Geothermal wells require a lower gas to water ratio because the steam and boiling water already present in the geothermal well give it the additional lift it needs to move the fluid compared to what would be found in a cold water well. A successful gas lift produces a gas water flow at the wellhead, and as the cold fluid is leaving the well bore, the hot fluid below will flow up and out to replace it. Provided this fluid is hot enough, it will boil as it flows up the well bore and create a sustained discharge. Self-sustained discharge may not occur if there is a feed of cold water in the upper part of the production zone since the airlift may simply bring more of this cold water into the well without disturbing the deeper, hotter fluid. If there is an extensive cold section at the top of the well bore greater than 500 meters, the discharge initiated by, pressur by pressurization, either natural pressurization or artificial pressurization of the well, he well head, may not be sustained because too much heat is lost from the boiling fluid inside the well bore to the cold surrounding formations, or the water level may be too deep to pressurize or gas lift. In this case, the injection of hot fluid to backfeed the wells may be needed. The valves are opened and the wellhead pressure is reduced, causing the heated water in the well bore to boil and the fluid to flow from the wellhead. In instance of this, it is worth remembering that even if a well is difficult to start, it does not mean that it is likely to be a poor producer in the long run. The well OK5 in Palapinian could not be discharged either by pressurization or airlift. However, steam injection was eventually successful in starting the flow, and it then after flow initiation, it flowed at a rate of 30 kilograms per second 
and 2,000 kilojoules per kilogram, which is a very good flowing well. The Sierra Preta wells were another set of wells that had a very long cold water portion at the top of the well bore, which prevented initial discharge. These wells required extensive gas lifting at a high rate to, to attain a steady discharge rate of 300 kilograms per second. This involved a lot of effort to begin the discharge phase, but the payoff was as good as any normal well or even better in the case of Kilopinian. So pr some production testing methods are used, to, and the production testing methods used are selected. Hmm. So selecting the type and size of equipment needed to test a geothermal well depends on the expected production rate of the well, the pressures of the well itself, and the fluid type. The expected fluid enthalpy will usually be known from testing nearby wells and downhole survey information. Expected production rate is estimated from the results of the permeability test done on the completion of a well. Where environmental conditions permit, a brief vertical discharge direct into the atmosphere can be used with the lit pressure method to get a first estimate of the long-term production potential and determine the most suitable equipment for longer-term testing. The vertical discharge can help estimate fluid enthalpy through the observation of the discharge plume, and it can also help clear debris from the well bore. So, some of the main methods used to flow test geothermal wells are single phase measurements, total flow calculator, a separator, the lip pressure method, and the tracer dilution method. When a well flows a single phase fluid, either liquid or dry steam, the testing process is simplified because the fluid enthalpy becomes much easier to calculate because you are only calculating for one phase, liquid or steam. The fluid enthalpy and ambiguity is removed. For low enthalpy wells, the fluid enthalpy of the well can be obtained directly from the steam tables. The temperature can be measured at liquid conditions obtained by downhole temperature measurements below the depth where the produced fluid starts to boil. Downhole temperature me measurements are particularly useful in multiple feed wells where the feed temperature of different zones is variable. If downhole temperature is used to obtain discharge enthalpy, it can be assumed that there is no heat loss from the well bore. If no boiling occurs, the mass flow rate can be obtained using a standard orifice plate or weir in enthalpy from the wellhead temperature. Total mass flow rate is calculated by the mass flow rate of water times the enthalpy gathered from steam tables and liquid enthalpy. Some of the flow rate measurement tools used are a sharp edged weir or an orifice plate meter. These two are shown in the diagrams here and they both measure the volumetric flow rates of the discharge and mass flow rate can be calculated accordingly. High enthalpy steam wells produce saturated or superheated steam. The flow rate is measured by orifice or kilo tube and temperature measurement techniques. If the non-condensable gas content is small, less than 2%, the following enthalpy can be plotted using the pressure temperature conditions for the steam on the Molier chart. If the steam is slightly wet, enthalpy is measured using a throttling calorimeter to reduce pressure to saturation conditions. Pressure and temperature both need to be measured in order to determine enthalpy. The normal condition for geothermal flow is that there is a two-phase fluid at the wellhead. Total flow calorimeters can be used to determine flow and enthalpy for small flow rates, and large capacity calorimeters are not portable and have significant heat loss during operation. Calorimeters are good apparatuses to use for flow and enthalpy determination. However, they can only measure small flow rates. The total well discharge is diverted into the calorimeter tank over a short period of time. The two-phase well discharge is condensed into cold water that already exists in the calorimeter tank, and the change in the volume and temperature of the liquid is used to calculate mass flow rate and enthalpy over a period of time. 
the mass change is represented by the volume times water density, and the mass enthalpy changes are divided by the time period of testing. Part A is a schematic diagram of a geothermal calorimeter arrangement, and B is an image of a calorimeter testing during pipe warmup. You can see in both of these that there is the wellhead um, with the wellhead pressure itself, the throttle valve where the it can be shut on and off. Um, the geothermal fluids flow through this tank through the three-way valve where some of the steam is let off the atmosphere and the geothermal fluid itself makes its way into the calorimeter tank where the volume changes and the temperature changes, which is recorded by the calorimeter to determine the enthalpy of the fluid. This portable calorimeter is only practical for geothermal wells with the li limited output of approximately 25 kilograms per second because of the limited tank capacity. This flow rate is considered small for commercial electric power production wells, and it would be impossible to increase the tank capacity in order to accommodate a larger mass flow rate. However, the tank size and increased cold water needed would make it difficult to transport a remote well test sites. Therefore, this method is only suitable for geothermal wells with low flow rates. A steam water separator is the most accurate method for measuring two phase flow systems. It separates the steam and non condensable gases from the water, which allow them to be individually measured by conventional methods discussed before. The efficiency of the system itself is about 99.9%, depending on the stability of the well flows. Here we can see a schematic of the steam water cyclone separator, which turns which spins the water and the combined liquid and separates the gas into the vapor outlet and into the liquid outlet, separating the water and the vapor so they can be measured. Another method is the James Litt pressure method. And for this is used for highly productive two-phase geothermal wells. It is the most versatile and economical method of testing. However, it is not as accurate as a separator, but it is advantageous as it is simply, it is, has simple hardware and instrumentation, and it can ac accommodate large flows for less money. When compared against each other, the separator and lit pressure methods, the enthalpy and the mass flow measurements tend to only vary by 5%, so there's not a huge difference between the two measurement-wise. One is more appropriate. The James Lit pressure method is more appropriate for high flow rate wells, however. To apply the Lit pressure method, the steam water mixture is discharged into the atmospheric pressure separator, also called a silencer, that reduces the noise level produced by the discharge because the discharge can be quite loud, as seen in the video at the beginning of the presentation. The Lit pressure is then measured at the end of the discharge pipeline as it enters the silencer, and the separated water flow exiting the silencer is measured over a sharp edge gear while steam is discharged into the atmosphere. Flowing enthalpy and total mass enthalpy is then calculated using the James equation. This is the James equation. The equation two is the James equation that can calculate the flow rate, G, by dividing the mass flow by the cross-sectional area of the pipe. The enthalpy can be calculated once you know the flow rate and lip pressure using equation one. Testing dry steam wells requires determining if the flow is dry or saturated. Remember, saturated is a mixture of liquid and steam that exists at a specific temperature, and pressure dry is when it's just steam. Temperature and pressure measured at the metering point should be measured simultaneously and the temperature should be compared to the saturation temperature. Superheat can be visually identified by the steam properties of the discharge. Saturated steam is initially transparent and then expands and forms regular steam clouds. Superheated steam is transparent and no cloud of condensed steam is visible at the wellhead. Some wells do not flow under stable conditions. They may have a regular or irregular cycle in which mass flow, enthalpy, and wellhead pressure vary periodically, while the flow control valves 
are all at a constant setting. They may cycle smoothly and rhythmically, or the regular flow may be interrupted by surges of pressure and water. This cycling behavior can result in difficulty with well control and flow measurement. It creates a production management problem. Cycling is caused by the presence of two significant feeds of different enthalpy and permeability. One feed has a bad permeability and is unable to sustain a continuous flow. You can see in this diagram a schematic of a cycling well where it has bursts of high pressure and then the pressure drops and then high pressure again and the pressure drops. This is a cyclic well that um, operates in a rhythm. It's not the one where it's just bursts of water. The accuracy and reliability of the flow measurements are affected by many factors, the most important ones being test method, equipment design, instrumentation, testing procedures, and the characteristics of the well. A non-stable well will not output accurate test data because the performance evaluation will not be completely accurate. The instruments need to be calibrated and the design of the metering devices should be recorded so the experiment can be repeated. A field check sheet establishes a traceable set of measurement data and should include pressure temperature flow measurement points, instrument calibration records, and their conditions before and after well testing, all times of flow equipment adjustments and instrument changes. The geothermal fields contain hydrogen sulfide gas, moisture, and chloride water that will all degrade the quality of the instrumentation and affect its accuracy. Regular maintenance of these instruments is required to keep the high quality to ensure reliable test data. Most instrumentation consists of pressure gauges, and these gauges need to be maintained to the ANSI B40.1M standards. The pressure sensors should have an accuracy of plus or minus 1%. The design of well test procedures can have a big influence on the reliability of test data. The longer the test period, the more reliable the test data is considered to be. But money and environmental constraints do not allow for long test periods, and accurate data must be collected during brief flow periods, lasting only a few days or hours. There are two categories of geothermal wells. Liquid fed, which are highly permeable wells that stabilize within hours of changing their flow conditions. Wells with lower permeability and those producing from two phase and steam reservoirs, which may never re reach consistent flow conditions. Other essential data to be collected during testing is fluid chemistry samples, non-condensable gas, and downhole measurements. The variability of mass flow, enthalpy, and chemistry in respect to wellhead pressure can help inferences be made about the reservoir. In liquid reservoirs and dry steam wells at constant temperature and gas content, the variations in flow output are controlled by variations in pressure at the wellhead and inside the reservoir. In all other, in all other cases, the performance of the well is sensitive to the enthalpy and variations in mass flow and enthalpy must be considered together. The well flow itself depends on pressure and enthalpy, and at a low flow rate with low pressure, the resistance to flow in the reservoir is unimportant, and the flow depends only on the pressure and enthalpy of the fluid entering the well. If the reservoir is normally pressured, temperature is the only variable. The maximum discharge pressure is the maximum pressure it can attain at the wellhead with the well flowing. If the well is progressively throttled from a large flow, the wellhead pressure increases until it reaches a maximum and there is a non-zero flow rate. Further throttling causes both pressure and mass flow to decrease. The following equation shows the correlation between max discharge pressure and temperature of the source fluid where the temperature is measured in degrees Celsius and the pressure is in bar absolute. In conclusion, production testing is needed to determine the flow characteristics of the well and if it will be a good producer of heat and energy. Following a testing procedure will ensure a da the data collection can be repeated and it is following the standards set for well collection. 
Determin determining the flow characteristics of a well is important to determine what type of testing procedure can be used for data collection.